Let's briefly review what we've discovered so far. We've looked at two classic problems, how to find the gradient of the tangent to a curve, and how to find the area underneath the curve. For the tangent, we used differentiation, and we did this from first principles. So we found that f dash of x was equal to the limit as h approaches zero of this formula, f of x plus h, take f of x, all over h. And then we also uh, found some uh, shortcuts to this as well. And this is what we call differentiation. Differentiation. And we'll have a look at some examples of what we did. So let's say we had a function such as x squared. This was our f of x, x squared. Uh, we did this, we differentiated this from first principles, and then we found some uh, shortcuts. So we found something called the power rule, which allowed us to differentiate without having to use this formula every single time. And the power rule says we multiply the coefficient by the exponent and then subtract one from the exponent. So this becomes 2x. The derivative of x squared we found was 2x. And we haven't looked at this yet, but we could also go the other way. So let's say I told you I had a function such as 3x squared, and I said that was the derivative of another function. We could, in theory, reverse the rules we use for differentiation and find uh, something called the antiderivative. And we're going to do more of this in following videos. Uh, but uh, you can, in fact, find antiderivatives just by reversing the rules of differentiation. Um, so for example, uh, for the power rule, when we add one to the exponent and multiply, sorry, multiply the coefficient by the exponent and add one to it, to reverse this, if we have ax to the n, we add one to the exponent and then di divide by n plus one, the exponent plus one. So for three x squared, if we add one to that exponent, that would be three, and then we divide by three, we end up with x cubed. And we also have to add on a constant. And we usually just say plus c, c for constant. The reason being that x cubed plus two, and x cubed plus 10, and x cubed minus pi, they all have the same derivative because the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, so we need to account for that when we go backwards by adding on a constant. But again, we'll look at that in more detail in following videos. The other classic problem we looked at was the area underneath the curve. And we also found this by using a limit. So let's draw a, a quick sketch of some function. And what we did was we divided this area up into rectangles. Let's say we wanted the area up to some value b. And we said the width of these rectangles was some delta x, some change in x. And then we wanted the limit as we increase the number of re those rectangles to infinity, or we, or another way to think of it is de decreasing the width to zero. So we had this formula. So we looked at the area from zero to b, and we used this symbol, which is the integration symbol. So the integral of f of x, we said was the limit as n approaches infinity or delta x approaches zero of the sum uh, from, from one to n of all of these heights, which was f of x sub i. That was the height of the rectangles multiplied by the widths, delta x. So we found the area under a curve using this method. It was very time consuming and clunky. Um, but that's what we did, and this was integration. Okay, so we've looked at these two classic problems, we've discovered solutions, um, but so far there is no reason to believe that these two things are related at all. There's no, you know, there's no kind of nothing telling us, well, actually the gradient of the tangent to a curve the derivative is related somehow to the integral, the area underneath the curve. Uh, but that's in fact what we're about to find out by looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's get into it. The fundamental theorem of calculus starts with an integral. 
So we have some function f and we want to integrate it. So we want the area underneath this curve. And we let this equal some other function and we call this capital F. Capital F of x is the area function or the integral of f of x. Uh, so let's draw a quick, a quick graph of this function. Okay, so we have some function and we're looking for the area underneath. Okay, so let's draw that in quickly. Let's say we're looking for the area up to some boundary um, and we're letting this area be a function of x. And this makes sense, right? Because as x increases, this area increases. Okay, so as we as we move this upper boundary to the right, the area f of x increases. So it is in fact a function of x. Um, and we are now also going to increase this area just a little bit. So let's say we add on a little bit to the area. And we're going to call this change, the width of this area we're going to call delta x. So let's say we, we increase that area and the width of that new area is delta x. Maybe you can see what's coming. Every time we've used delta x in the past, we've used some kind of limit. So maybe you are guessing that we're about to take some kind of limit and you would be right. So the next question I have is how can we find an expression for this new red area? Uh, well, we know the area in terms of f of x all the way up to this upper boundary. We could, in terms of f of x, we could label that f of x plus delta x, right? So whatever this boundary was, we've just added delta x onto it and this value would give us the total area. Uh, then we could subtract, then we could subtract the area we had before up to this first boundary, which was just f of x, and that would give us this new area in red, right? So we've just taken the upper boundary, uh, the area all the way up to the upper boundary, subtracted the area up to the first boundary. Now suppose we divided this new area, this red area, by its width, delta x. What would that give us? Well, if we pretended it was a rectangle for a moment, it would technically give the height, right? So dividing a rectangle, the, the area of the rectangle by the width gives you the height. Now it's not a rectangle, it's a curve, um, but there's something called the mean value theorem that tells us that in fact, the, the average height of this area must be between its two boundaries. So if we do divide this area by its width, we will get some value for f of x somewhere between these two boundaries. Now I'm not going to go into this in detail because at this stage you don't really need to understand the mean value theorem, but the reason I mention it is so that you can go ahead and research it yourself if you would like to. Uh, but basically the idea is we're getting an average height, which is somewhere on f of x between these two boundaries. And now what we're going to do is think about if we reduce this width to zero. So we, we are now going to take a limit a limit as delta x approaches zero, what happens? Well, that average height gets pushed to this first boundary. Let's zoom in on this section of the curve here. Let's take a little snapshot um, and take a closer look. So we have this, this little section of the curve above this area. Um, so it's looking something like this and we said that we had an average height somewhere on this curve uh, and we have this uh, lower boundary, this orange lower boundary and the red upper boundary and it's somewhere in between those and as delta x, the width of this section, as delta x approaches zero, this point, this average height is going to get pushed 
to the left towards the, the height, the f of x at the lower boundary, right? So whatever, whatever f of x this is, this point here. So as delta x approaches zero, this whole thing, this average height of this area is just approaching the, the f of x of our upper boundary of the original area. In other words, all of this is equal to f of x. And what do we have on the left here? What do we have on the left here? What does this look like? This is the derivative, right? This is the derivative from first principles of capital F of X. So this is the derivative, derivative of capital F of X. In other words, what we've just said is that the derivative of capital F is equal to the function small f of x. This is a really big deal. Why? One application is very practical. Uh, straight away, we can, if we want to find the area underneath a function, instead of doing all of that business with rectangles, remember when we wanted to find the area underneath x squared, we had to draw all of these rectangles and uh, take the limit as the width of those rectangles approaches zero. Instead of doing all of that business, we can just find an antiderivative of f of x. So to find, so to find the area, the integral of f of x, we just take the antiderivative, antiderivative of f of x. Okay, so I think this is worth just spending a little bit more time on just kind of reinforcing why this is the case. In the first equation, we say that the integral of f of x, the area underneath the curve is equal to some function capital F. And it turns out when we take the derivative, if we differentiate this function, when we differentiate the integral, we get it, the function itself. In other words, a continuous function is always equal to a derivative and the antiderivative is the area function. Okay, so whenever we want the area function of a particular function, we just take the antiderivative and that gives us the area under the curve. This is super useful. And so in the following videos, we're going to be looking at finding antiderivatives and consequently, being able to find areas under functions using antiderivatives rather than um, all of that business with rectangles and limits. In fact, we could look at one example quickly now. Uh, remember when we took the integral of x squared and we said from zero to b, uh, we took the integral from zero to b of x squared dx and we said this was b cubed over three. Uh, well, now let's find the antiderivative of x squared. So we also use the integration symbol for this when we're just finding an antiderivative. So let's go ahead and just reverse the rules of differentiation. So again, remember we said this was ax to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. So we'll add 1 to the power, divide by that power, so it will be x to the 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1. Uh, and we also never should forget to add a constant. This is x cubed over 3 plus c. And so notice the relationship between the integral from 0 to b of x squared, b cubed over 3, and just the general antiderivative, x cubed over 3 plus c. Notice we don't have a constant when we're looking at uh, uh, the area between two boundaries. This is something called a definite integral, meaning it has a specific area that we're looking at, or, you know, boundaries. Uh, this is something called an in indefinite integral, where we don't care about, you know, an area, we're just looking at a general antiderivative. But you can still see the relationship, we're getting x cubed over three and b cubed over three. And the b cubed over three, we found we had to use, um, you know, the sum of squares formula to get there. It was actually quite a long process to, to find this from 
first principles using limits. And here we just got to this x cubed over 3 pretty much straight away just by reversing, uh, just by finding an antiderivative. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of the power of the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's what it allows us to do, to find these integrals just using antiderivatives uh, rather than limits. So hope you found this video useful. Uh, please leave a like if you did, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.